I'm Cindy Flower, rheumatology from just from Barbados, who will be chairing this session, which aims to tell the world what's in the lesser developed countries and re countries with restricted resources, how we practice the management of SLE. Uh, Matt calls what we do experiments of necessity, but hopefully uh, we can all learn from it to establish a best practice in the diagnosis and management of SLE. I will begin with the Barbadian experience, and I will first say that the Barbadian experience began to be documented with the advent of the renal clinic by Professor Nicholson in 1981. So we have about 30 years experience on the island. Our island is about 166 square miles with a population close to 300,000, of whom over 90% are of African origin. Our SLE registry indicated that, of, that as of December 2009, there were about 228 SLE patients alive on the island. We diagnose about 12 to 23 cases yearly, and we basically have a system largely of socialized medicine. Now, before cases of SLE can be managed, they first have to be identified. And uh, one of the challenges to identification of SLE is limited serologic data. It relates to ACR criteria 10 and 11. So we don't have this uh, reliably available. But fortunately, SLE is a clinical diagnosis. And what we've learned is that it can be diagnosed clinically. Our, we have a mantra, which was actually taught to me by Professor Nicholson, and which we disseminate widely. Young black women of childbearing age with rheumatoid-like arthritis have lupus until proven otherwise. And this statement is actually as powerful as it is simple. And it actually is a factor that helps us keep our case ascertainment of SLE on the island complete. One of our challenges in the management of SLE was the late presentation of lupus nephritis. So patients presented with uremic complications and with anasarca. And we've addressed this by having patients be taught how to do monthly home testing for proteinuria. And they actually do this for the first three years of the disease because when we review our lupus nephritis data, it reveals that 98% of our patients with lupus nephritis develop that complication within the first three years of the disease. And one of the challenges in the management of lupus nephritis, which is our main cause of mortality and morbidity in SLE, was absent uh, renal histopathologic data for a host of resource uh, reasons. For instance, for the last couple of years, there's been the lack of renal biopsy needles. Sometimes there's non-functioning ultrasound equipment, inadequate lab resources. And we also don't have anti-double-stranded DNA titers and complement titers available on the island. So again, we've learned to use clinical indices to manage our patients with lupus nephritis. First, we use the clinical presentation as a, to help determine what the likely renal pathology is, such as, as you will all know, patients with nephrotic syndrome likely have membranous disease, patients with hypertension and renal impairment uh, may, and heavy proteinuria may have a proliferative disease. Uh, we also identify the clinical parameters that best correlate with outcome or poor outcome in SLE, such that our very young patients who are present with significant renal impairment and are anemic, hypertensive, that identifies a subgroup of SLE patients who need more aggressive management. So that factors into our decisions. Uh, we're also very cognizant of the fact that there are social coordinates of disease outcome, things like non-compliance and how well certain medications are accepted by a population, how much a person will accept uh, a life uh, altering or life-saving intervention like dialysis. So being aware of these factors allows us then to address them uh, frontally. And we simply use the level of proteinuria, so a falling level of proteinuria, and an improvement in the creatinine clearance to monitor uh, the disease response. Now, what do we use as induction agents in lupus nephritis? In 2006, we reviewed our cases of SLE, diagnosed SLE nephritis diagnosed between 1995 and 2004, that 10-year period. And we found that patients with proteinuria and normal creatinine clearance uh, can and, and do respond to azathioprine, which in our setting is a very cheap and safe drug. So that patients who had proteinuria 
less than three grams in 24 hours and a normal creatinine clearance, that group of patients had a 100% response to azathioprine. Those with uh, proteinuria over three grams in 24 hours and a normal creatinine clearance had about a 71% response to azathioprine. And then we looked at the patients who had proteinuria and reduced creatinine clearance. Uh, creatinine clearance in that group was about 40 mils per minute or less. And what we found was they did not respond well to cyclophosphamide. We, in fact, only had a 22% response. So that, that helps us inform decisions. So in someone who presents with severe lupus nephritis with a much compromised creatinine clearance, uh, our practice would be to try to get an alternative like, like Celsep, microphenolate morphotil, or rituximab for that person. Uh, but then more conveniently or easily, we would try to get patients to present earlier before they have such compromise to their creatinine clearance. Now, how would we optimize outcomes for patients with SLE on our island? We want to establish locally relevant clinical protocols, not just for lupus nephritis, for a number of other uh, complications. We, we look at the standard literature and the recommendations, we look at our local experience and we adapt. We, like many other regions, need more affordable drugs. We do need improved hospital services. So as Dr. Nicholson said, we don't have a potentially successful project uh, embedded in a larger failure. And what would be particularly useful for us is for the development of uh, reliable and, uh, and cost-effective biomarkers for SLE nephritis so that it can help inform decisions in areas like ours where renal histopathologic data is not readily available. Uh, well, thank you, and we would invite any comments. We have uh, Professor Nicholson, who's a nephrologist on our island, who first established a renal clinic where there was uh, an accumulation of SLE patients, which I inherited when I established a rheumatology clinic in 1997. And from one of the other islands, Jamaica, we have uh, Dr. Desiree Tullock reed who's had to adapt what she learned as a fellow in Toronto to her r real circumstances at a, a hospi public hospital in Jamaica. Are there any questions from the audience I should ask? Yeah. Well, just a comment. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Flower for that um, excellent synopsis, which I think we can all relate to in one sense or another in the Caribbean islands. Depending to a large extent, um, to what degree, there are some economic challenges. And that's certainly been the case in Jamaica. Um, what um, information coming out of disease registries like yours, Professor Nicholson and Cindy, um, helps to do is um, provide some validation for us as we're doing our clinical care. We no longer need to feel as though we're trying to do second best or that, you know, as you say, we're experimenting by necessity. But when we have published data um, that you're able to provide, it helps to provide some validation for what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's a process uh, lending for more improvement, really. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm Dr. Dupleu from South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, regarding your work, your health workforce, how many doctors per patient, per 100,000 patients do you have? On, do you the, on the whole island? I think yeah. we have about 400, uh, or three or 400 general practitioners on and the island. For the population is? Is 280,000 people. 280,000, thank you very much. Mm. We have two nephrologists, well, three, if when Professor Nicholson comes out of retirement. Okay.